Joshua chapter 2 is where we're going to be tonight. Old Testament, right after the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Book number 6 in the Bible. Second chapter right at the beginning. A few weeks ago, we talked a little bit about Joshua and faith, going into the land, obeying the Lord. And tonight, I want to look a little bit more at the next chapter of Joshua. I want to look at chapter 2. You know, for all of us that are sitting here tonight, You might feel you might feel poor. You might feel destitute. You might feel broken. Maybe you're feeling like things are finally turning around for you. And you're here and and you're you're hopeful, praise God. But there's a finite amount of one thing that you're going to have on this earth. You can't make any more of it. You can't buy it. You can't manufacture it. You can't sell it. And it's time. You have a certain amount of time and it's all you got. And the time that's already been spent is gone. You can't reclaim it. You can't go and make a return and get a refund. It's not like you bought something at Kroger and you're not happy with it or Costco and you can take it back, no questions asked, and get your time back. Once you spend your time, it's spent. It's gone. You only get so much of it. It's precious. And the thing is, is you don't know how big your bank account is when it comes to time. I have no idea how much time sits in your account, and neither do you. You might live to be 100 years old. I might die tonight on the way home. I have no idea. The Lord knows your minutes are marked, your seconds are numbered. The breaths in your body have been known for an eternity past by the creator of the universe. But you don't get to know that. You have no idea how much time you have. And what you do with your time is important because it's the only thing in your life that's really, truly limited. You can always find a way to make money. You can always find a way to get a meal. You can always find a way to get some shelter. Now, it might not be the shelter you want or the meal you want or the money you want, but you can find a way to get some. But... There's no way for you to manufacture time, even with unlimited resources. You might buy a few minutes, maybe, if you're sick, but you're not gonna buy much. Steve Jobs had pancreatic cancer. It's a billionaire. First human being to have his entire genetic sequence mapped paid for a team to map his entire genome so that they could come up with custom cancer treatments. There's no telling the amount of money that he spent trying to stay alive. I have no idea. Maybe it was $100 million. I have no idea. It was a lot. Money didn't matter. He had an unlimited bank account for all practical purposes. Apple right now has more cash reserves than something like a third of all the countries on the planet rich enough to be its own country he wasn't worried about money but he was worried about time and yet with all that money with all the airplanes with all the research capability when the Lord said it was his time it was his time there's only so much you get so what you do with your time is important, and right now is the most precious time you will ever have because it's the only time you have any influence over, is right now. Because you don't know if you're getting tomorrow. You can't do anything about yesterday. 
So make now your most precious time. Now will never come again. And it's all that you have to influence. What will you do with that time? What will you do with the time that the Lord has given you? Will you grow? Will you choose to have faith in God? Will you choose to exercise faith and allow him to exercise authority in your life to hopefully turn the ship, to have victory, to overcome the struggles that you have, to repair the relationships that have been damaged, and to have joy. How about that? Forget about, forget about fixing the relationships and overcoming the addictions and all that. How about just to wake up in the morning and have genuine joy? I bet a lot of you would struggle. I mean, if I were to ask you, you remember the last time that you woke up genuinely happy without a dozen problems on your plate? Where the first thing when you thought when you woke up in the morning was an oh no. You know, where you were genuinely happy to meet the day. Excited about the potential that it had. Probably been a long time for some of you. But you can remember it. You remember what that was like, hopefully. If you've never had that, I'm sorry. It's possible. But it's out there. Genuine, true, real joy. The kind of joy that you wake up with and you go, I'm excited for today. And I'm excited for the things that I'm going to be able to do today. That kind of joy is real. That kind of joy exists. And when you have that kind of joy, the other things in your life that are broken, they start to heal. Because it's your testimony, it's your joy that will impact your relationships, impact the lives around you, impact the problems that have been created in your past. That will be the medicine that fixes your problems. When your children see the joy of the confidence of your faith. When they see that there's an actual genuine transformation, they will be curious. They will want to know. They will desire what you have. You can't buy it. You can't sell it. And you can't make it. That's the only other thing on this world that isn't for sale and it isn't available besides time. And that's the true joy of the Lord. There's only one way that you get it, and it's by faith. I want to look at a woman tonight that had faith, unbelievable faith. She was David's great-grandmother. King David, who is the great, 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 I don't know how many great-grandfather of Jesus, and the one whom the bloodline flowed through, the one that we read in the Psalms, Jesus sits on David's throne. And to David, I will always be faithful. I want to talk about King David's great-grandmother tonight. A princess in Israel. A woman whose descendants produced a royal bloodline. A woman of extraordinary faith. Did I mention that she was a prostitute? That's right. David's great-grandmother. A woman whose faith is mentioned twice in the New Testament. Next to the faith of Abraham. Next to the faith of Jacob. In the hallmark of heroes of faith, she was a prostitute in Jericho, a hooker in a big city. But the Lord, the Lord told her that they were coming. And she had something precious, something valuable. It was faith. And while the Lord was working on her heart, letting her know that there was a change coming, the Lord was working on the hearts of the Israelites. It's an amazing story. It's a chapter. It's one chapter in a whole book. 
Not a lot there, but yet there's so much. And so we read, Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. Jericho was the big city, the walled city, the fortified city. Now keep in mind that just a generation ago, Joshua and Caleb and ten other spies had been sent to spy out the land. We talked about them. Their lack of faith was so poor that except for Joshua and Caleb, who said the land is ripe, let's take it. The rest of them were like, no, there's fortified cities there. There's giants there. Yes, there's milk and honey and grapes and there is plentiful there. But we won't be, there's giants there that are going to slay us. For 40 years, Joshua has been walking in the desert, watching a faithless generation die off. And now he sends two of the next generation who watched their parents make the wrong decisions. This time he sends two. Maybe, maybe he learned from the last time and said, well, only two good ones came back. So maybe this time we'll just send two good ones. I don't know. Doesn't say why he only sent two this time, but he sent two. And he says, go and spy out the land, especially Jericho, because Jericho was the big city. They were going to have to take it. If you wanted to take the area, you had to take the big city. That's how it was in the ancient world. You would, you would fortify your large city. You would build big, thick walls. You would wall in the city. Your people would come in at night. They would work the farms and the areas around, and then at night they would come in, and the gates to the city would be closed. And then that way, if an attacking army came, they would be safely behind the walls. They could shoot them with arrows and they could hopefully ride out a siege. The idea behind the ancient warfare was that you would build a city big enough, thick enough, and with enough food and water reserves that you inside could outlast the army on the outside. It was a starvation game more than anything else. Who was gonna starve to death first? The inhabitants of the city? or the army exhausting the, exhausting the resources that were left outside the city. Because when they came into the city, they took whatever they could carry, they would store their stuff in the city. And an army that would camp out, it wasn't like there was FedEx. You didn't go, hey, we're low on wheat, we need to call back to headquarters and have them ship in another pallet for the army. You would use what was available around you in the surrounding lands. But these were soldiers at war, they weren't farmers. So they would exhaust the supply, and if the war went on much longer than a whole season, it was likely that the army was going to get hungry, and they were going to go home. And the city would survive a siege. It was a waiting game. It was about who had more resources. Jerusalem was famously difficult to take because it had its own supply of water, a spring on a mountain, incredibly rare. Most cities were located on valleys by rivers because they needed water. Jerusalem was the exception, a mountain city that actually had access to water. Made it very difficult to take. You can live a long time without food. So they say. I've only ever gone it, well, five days, my record without food. But they say you can go a long time. Water, though, three days, that's about it. By the fourth day, you're in trouble, so you need water. So he's sending out these spies. It's tactical as much as anything else. Go check it out, especially Jericho, because we got to take Jericho. So he sends them. So they went and they came into the house of the harlot, the prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. Now, it's not a mistake that they came to Rahab. See, the Lord works on both sides of any equation. It's not a mistake when you go up to witness to somebody and they go, you know, it's amazing you're here. I was hoping that the Lord would send somebody. It's not a mistake when you are in desperate need of something and somehow it miraculously comes to be that it's taken care of. Because the Lord works both ends of the equation. He prepares hearts and he sends people to them. All throughout the Bible, we see that the Lord is working both ends. We see the woman at the well, a prostitute with five husbands. Not a prostitute, but she had five husbands. Adulteress. And we see her sitting at the well, and Jesus had decided that day that they would go through Samaria. The long way that Jews didn't take because Samaria wasn't very friendly. Normally, they took a shorter route. But Jesus that day said, no, we're going to walk through his Samaria. The disciples thought he was nuts. But he went there. And he came midday to a well. 
when nobody draws water because it's hot. And there was the woman. And she had been waiting. And Jesus told her that he was Messiah. Told her about the husbands that she had had and she by faith believed and went to that town and told everybody. And there was revival. It wasn't a mistake that she was at the well and it wasn't a mistake that Jesus said, let's go through Samaria today because they never went through Samaria. It's not a mistake that they ended up at this prostitute. I mean, Jericho had to be full of prostitutes. It's an ancient city full of a lot of guys and, you know, in a society that did not condemn prostitution. There had to be hundreds, if not thousands of prostitutes in the area. It was like Memphis. There's plenty of prostitutes here. See an arrest on the news every third day. I don't know where they are. I just see them getting arrested. I'm not looking for them, so I couldn't tell you. But it exists in every major city. It doesn't matter where you are. Some more than others. Jericho had its fill of prostitutes, but yet they found the house of Rahab. And I didn't mean to impugn Memphis. I'm sure Nashville has its full share as well. I'm sure Chicago does. I mean, it's just, it's a reality of life. But they found Rahab. And it was told to the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you. So somehow word got out that the new guys in town, the travelers, the Israelites, had visited Rahab. Obviously, there was a lot of foot traffic in that part of town. Somebody saw so he goes and he sends people, he says, bring them out, bring these foreigners out of here, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman, Rahab, the woman, had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it came about that when it was time to shut the gate at dark, that the men went out. I don't know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. She lies for these Israelites to her fellow countrymen. Not only does she say that they're not here, but she creates a completely false narrative and alibi for them. They left, they went that way. Go quickly, send your men, you will overtake them. And they go and they leave to go get the men. At this point, she has no idea what these Israelites are going to do with her. She hasn't entered into any type of arrangement with them. She hasn't negotiated a payment for hiding them. It doesn't say, and then she said to the Israelites, if you will give me a hundred ounces of gold, I will hide you here. Or if you pay me this, I will conceal you. Realize that the negotiation element of this has not transpired yet. By faith, she is hiding these men. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan, to the fords, to the streams. And as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they laid down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all of the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard. We have heard. In Romans it says faith comes by hearing. By hearing the word of God. Amen. They had heard the news of the Israelites. Though how the Lord had dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And when we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven, above and on earth beneath. 
they had heard. They had heard of how the Red Sea had been dried up and how they had crossed and that the Pharaoh's army had been wiped out. They had heard of the mighty battles that had been won. And the fear of the Lord had spread among the men of the town. It was not a mistake that they went there. See, it's interesting that when believers or people of faith gather together, isn't it amazing how faith builds on faith? These spies were sent to spy out the land, to gauge resistance, to understand just what they were walking into. And here they come to Rahab, a prostitute, who probably would be better equipped to know the mindset of the single man army people of the city more than most. I mean, she probably had interactions with a fair number of soldiers. It would be a reasonable assumption. She knew the minds and the hearts of the army. When she said that they had lost their courage, when it had melted away before them, she was speaking from firsthand experience of listening probably to accounts of these men who were coming to her as paying customers and going, I am terrified of what's about to come. She would have known. And it had melted away before. Imagine how encouraged these two Israelites had to have been. Imagine how encouraged the two spies were. Wow. We're walking in and we're going to roll into here. It's going to be great. The last report said that there were giants in the land and that we were going to get crushed. The report today is that they're melting before us in fear. And we're hearing it from their own women, from their own people. But then she goes on and says, For the Lord your God, He is God, in heaven above and on earth beneath. See, God has always been the God of those who call upon Him. We like to think of the Old Testament and go, Well, that's the God of the Jews, the God of Israel. But the reason that God was the God of Israel was because Abraham chose Him. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. God chose the one who chose him and said, I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. You have faith and I will bless you. I will take you the smallest and the weakest and I will make you great to glorify my name because you have believed. It wasn't exclusive. We see in Ruth that another Moabite, a woman who is not an Israelite, says that your God will be my God and your people, my people. Right here, Rahab makes a declaration of faith. She says, I will believe. In James 2, it said, you see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scriptures was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. So Rahab now is going to demonstrate her faith, a command that you all have to do. When you go and you get baptized, you are demonstrating your faith publicly. When you go and you share the gospel, and when you serve others, you are demonstrating your faith. James says that faith without works is dead. Without works, without a testimony, what good is your faith? Show me your faith. If you show me your works, I will see your faith. If you say you have faith, but there are no works, how could I know? The joy that is in you has got to produce works if it's real. It's not that the works save you, but the works flow naturally from a true and genuine faith. If there is no faith, there certainly won't be works. So she says that your God is God. Now, therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you. Notice that there was no bargain up front, no payment and arrangement for hiding you. Now she says, I declare your God to be God by faith. And so because your God is my God, because he is the God, I ask you as a believer in the same God to deal kindly with me. 
Jesus commands all of us to love one another. So here she is saying, I believe in your God. Will you love me? Will you spare me? Will you deal kindly with me? I have dealt kindly with you. Will you deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death? Deliver my family. Just like God delivered Noah's family. Just like God delivered Lot's family. Deliver us from destruction. See, God is merciful. God is willing to deliver you if you will simply come to him. God is faithful. So the men said to her, our life for your life. If you do not tell this business of ours, it shall come about that when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. She then let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall so that she was living on the wall. And she said to them, go to the hill country, lest the pursuers happen upon you and hide yourselves there for three days until the pursuers return. Then afterwards, you may go on your way. And the men said to her, We shall be free from this oath to you, which you have made for us to swear, unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down, and gather to yourself into your house your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household. And it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be free. But anyone who is with you in this house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on them. If you will tie this scarlet rope on the window, the same one that you let us down, and you will gather your family here, we will not lay a hand on you. You know, the Bible is very careful about the words that it uses. Paper was valuable. Real estate on that paper was valuable. This would have been written on, they would have taken the skins of animals like leather and they would have dried it out in a special way often and they would have written their scrolls on them. It was an expensive, time-consuming process to manufacture a scroll. Very few people were skilled in the art of writing it. It was really something, you know, now we take, you know, paper for granted. I can, you know, run a thousand copies of something over at Kinko's in 15 minutes. Get as much as you want. Mm -hmm. All you want. Paper's nothing now. Words are nothing. You All you want. We have as much paper, as much writing as you want. But this is an era where paper, scrolls, books, all of this is rare, valuable, expensive. The purview of the wealthy and the religious. But yet the Holy Spirit took time to say a scarlet rope. Not a rope, but a scarlet rope. The Holy Spirit took the time to identify the color of the rope. You see, it's by the blood that there is remediation, that there is forgiveness for sins. That's right, by the blood. You have to get under the blood. When Adam committed sin, God killed an animal and covered them in the fur. Something had to die. When Abel offered his sacrifice, a lamb was slaughtered. Amen. When there was a ram in the bush for Abraham, it was slaughtered. When the nation of Israel was passed over during the Exodus story, they were commanded to take their Passover lambs and to take hyssop and to paint all of their doors with the blood of the lamb. And this angel of death would pass over them and no one inside would have a hand laid upon them. Amen. And so he says to her, if you will take this red cord and you will put it on your door, we will pass over you and not a hand will be laid upon you. All through the Bible, there is a redemptive red thread of salvation. It flows from beginning to end. I just finished reading Revelation in my quiet time. I've been reading through the Bible and I just got to the end today. And worthy is the lamb who was slain 
to receive honor and praise and glory. And they were worshiping the lamb at his feet, the one who was slain, the one who bled. When Jesus hung on that cross, he, for once and for all, offered an atoning blood sacrifice that would absolve you of all of the sins that you have done. Rahab got under that scarlet thread, she hung it on her door, and she said, I will have faith to believe in your God. And I ask you to deal kindly with me. The Israelites dealt so kindly with her that she wound up marrying and becoming the great-grandfather of a king of Israel. Her name is memorialized in the book of Matthew and the descendants of Jesus. She went from a prostitute in Jericho to a princess and the mother of a king. What did that? Faith. Faith did that. Faith took her from a place of being powerless, of being used, of being abused, of being a prostitute. And took her to a place where her entire family was redeemed. And where her name is remembered. Because she had faith. Jesus said that if you'll have the faith of a mustard seed, you can see a mountain move from here to there. All of you have mountains in your lives. Sin mountains. That you have not been able to move. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's family conflict. Maybe it is a childhood trauma that you have not been able to get past. But there's a mountain in your way. There is a mountain that you have been unable to move. And Jesus promises that if you will just have that faith, that he can move that mountain for you. Just like Rahab stood in front of strangers that owed her nothing and promised her nothing and said, I will have faith. I will have faith that you will spare me because I have heard what your God can do. And he is the God of creation. There is evidence of it. I have heard the stories. If you will have faith, God will show you the evidence of his power. And then your life will be a testimony to other lives. That's how you witness to people. Just tell them what Jesus has done for you. It's the truth. I'm here because of what Jesus has done for me. They're here because of what Jesus has done for them. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus will do it for you too. All you need is faith. Let's pray. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for the testimony of Rahab that even now we read thousands of years later, and it testifies to your great mercy and love. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, I pray that tonight, if there is somebody here who has never declared you to be God, who has never believed in you, who has never stepped out in faith, that tonight would be the night that they would decide to put their faith in you. Tonight would be the night that they would decide to surrender to you. That they would come before you, King Jesus, and say, I need you. That I'm broken, that I'm a sinner. I've broken the laws of your, your word, and I need you, sweet Jesus. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you shed blood to pay for my sins. And I believe that you rose again from the dead and that you are alive. And that you are reigning and I surrender to you as my king. Oh, King Jesus, I surrender to you and I just ask you to give me your spirit. By faith, I will believe. Change my life, Jesus. I know you can. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, I pray that we would all step out in faith this week. That we would worship you as holy. 
that we would glorify your name, that we would praise you at every turn, that we would be in a state of awe of your majesty, that we would draw close to you, and that we would sing in our hearts of your great deeds. And Lord, I pray that you would pour your spirit out on the center, that you would make your face shine upon these warriors, that you would break revival out in Memphis here, Lord, that from here people would see your power and that lives would be transformed. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, it's in the matchless name of Jesus, the Messiah, I pray. Amen. Amen.